and talking about uh, Emmanuel is going to talk about the survey and the current practice within the network and he's going to propose some new collaborative uh, studies and then uh, at the end uh, we'll have also proposals from other members of the of the uh, team of the uh, yeah, it's group to propose other studies if they wish okay Emmanuel okay. Uh, it's not really a presentation because, uh, as you know, this, in this meeting we, we, we like to uh, share ideas and to start uh, collaborative work. So it's more kind of a discussion about what we have done recently in co collaborative studies and what we could do next uh, in the few months. So in 2017 there has been three papers coming from the network. Uh, two papers about the survey we did in 2015. Uh, one about the general results, uh, which has been published in Neuro-Oncology uh, Practice. And uh, as you know, this uh, paper is not uh, indexed in PubMed. So there is this idea that we could uh, pay uh, about 2,000 uh, euros to make it uh, open access. And if it is open access, it will be uh, automatically indexed in uh, PubMed. So maybe I will... Uh, uh, I, I could send you uh, a bank account of uh, the Department of Neurosurgery of Larry Boisier so that you could make, uh, uh, so that each center could pay uh, 100 euros so that we could pay the 2,000 uh, euros to make it open access. That's a possibility if, uh, if, you, if you want it. Maybe if we just wait a few more months, it will be automatically indexed in PubMed. So, I don't know what's your opinion. Do you think we should uh, pay now for making it open access, or should we wait that it will be automatically done? I don't know what's your opinion. No ideas? You want to pay? OK. Who want to pay? OK. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I will, uh, I will, uh, I will probably uh, propose you to pay, and uh, let's see if we get uh, enough uh, funds to to make it. And there are two other papers: the one of Adria Rofes about uh, cognitive uh, assessment, and the one of Gian Antonio Spina about uh, epilepsy. And there are other papers in preparation, still uh, about this survey. Uh, the anesthesiologist part was supposed to be by uh, our team in Larry Boisier, but uh, the work is not done. So maybe see if someone wants to, to, to take it, it's, uh, it's possible. Yeah. Uh, the radiology part, I think uh, Christian was uh, working on it because he sent, uh, he sent us uh, a new survey with some additional questions. So maybe you will talk about it and give some words. And the radiation therapy part as well is uh, in progress, I guess. So in the general uh, paper, uh, we identified uh, three major questions. Uh, how do extent of resection and rate of work resumption co correlate? What is the survival benefit of first-line PCV versus temozolomide? And what are the survival and functional results in patients treated by upfront radiation therapy compared to patients treated by delayed radiation therapy? So uh, for the first point, there is uh, an ongoing pilot study, uh, which is uh, led by uh, Philip. Uh, we try to, at least uh, with uh, three centers, to build the resection probability map and to get the information about the work resection rate and try to see if we can correlate uh, extent of resection with uh, rock resumption. The idea is, for example, that in Munich, in the group of uh, Sandro, uh, right hemisphere uh, is not operated and awake, uh, yes, and maybe the extent of resection will be greater, and maybe the work resumption rate will be smaller. But of course, it's a pilot study because uh, the rock resumption rate might not be that much a good proxy. Uh, it depends on multiple parameters, including the insurance policy of the patient and so on. So it's really a kind of a pilot study. And for the point two and three, uh, as I said, I don't think that a randomized study will make it. And so we need to make multicentric wide prospective uh, series. 
And there is two kind of methodology, either uh, the EORTC methodology where you send all the data and you centralized all the data in, a, in one structure, or something more like how the brain is functioning, so each uh, center just, just is able to communicate with other centers, and depending on the study, you readapt the size of the network. And, uh, but one essential point in this structure is that we need to have a format to communicate. So that was the idea of uh, creating a gliocom format, a, a way of structuring the clinical data <coughs> so that we can exchange the data as for a DICOM uh, image. So in the, in the paper, we published some ideas about what could be this gliocom format. The general format is just a series of dates and events and the events have to be standardized. You, you cannot choose any kind of events. You, there is a code book stating what can be uh, an event. Uh, but still, it's very difficult first to make this uh, gliocom format uh, kind of uh, functional. And maybe a simple idea would be just to implement it under uh, Excel software, because we can imagine that uh, if it is done under Excel software, it's very easy to exchange the files and to exchange the patients. So that that's could be a possibility to be discussed. And uh, I know also that there are other uh, proposals. I mentioned uh, two, but there is a third one uh, from this morning. Uh, Sandro would like to replicate the recent results of uh, Nader Sanai about the correlation between uh, epilepsy and residual tumor. So, yes? Sandro, maybe you can talk about it a little bit more. And Thomas Santarius, who was not able to come here, uh, proposed to um, re-evaluate the role of biological marker, but taking uh, into account also uh, the growth rates and the surgery. So he would like to do a retrospective, a large retrospective series to re-evaluate the role of the biological marker but assessing also the growth rates and the surgical volume. And uh, finally, Marie-Thérèse uh, also proposed to launch a study with a systematic uh, analysis of uh, pre-op, immediate post-op, and late post-op uh, post uh, neuropsychological assessments. So the discussion is open. Somebody would like to propose something different, something else? Yes, somebody there. <laughs> no, no, I give you a microphone. Okay, I think Jaina will talk about this, and I, I don't know where she is. And there's, uh, Jaina will talk about this, and I embrace it, and I think that uh, adapting the tulip in different languages is something that we should do. Uh, but thinking about it from a conservative point of view and thinking about the paper that we published all together, so thanks for that. I think that we should move forward in a conservative way and, and do baby steps. And I think that already a huge step for all of us would be that we adapt an object naming task and that we use an object naming task that is the same for all centers. At the moment, we know, for example, that Dufault has been using the DO80, which uses pictures on the Snodgrass and Van der Waal battery, that from a cognitive neuropsychological perspective, they're not so good, but, <clears throat> but they're being used and it's working. We've seen the results. I use that task in Italian as well, and it works. It's fine. I know Lorenzo Bello is not using the same pictures, for example. Motomura in Japan is using different pictures. Uh, Jaina and Elke are using different pictures as well. They have, they have a mixture of different pictures. So I think that uh, in the Spanish group is using different pictures as well. So I think that if we would have some sort of homogeneous, at least in the task that we use all together, uh, that we use the most, which is object naming, I think that would be a good step. Yes. That's, that's one thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a real issue, but uh, in fact, uh, uh, there is two different levels of uh, homogenization for the task. So one level is which cognitive function we test, and I think this should be uh, homogeneous. And the other level is which task we used for this uh, cognitive uh, subpart. And I think that this level does not 
really need to be homogeneous because whatever the picture naming task that you will use, the important thing that we are interested in is the evolution of the patient. So the patient is, is, on, uh, is on reference. So what we want to see is that uh, does the patient, is there worsening in picture naming or not, whatever the, the real set of pictures that you have selected. So I think there is two different levels of uh, homogenizing what kind of cognitive function we want to assess, and the other level is which specific task we use for each domain, and not sure it's really important to, to make it uh, uniform. So here there, there's another thing. So if, if we use object naming, we know that we're assessing the semantic system and we're, using, we're assessing the lexical level as well as the output level. So in that sense, we're doing it the homogeneous way, the, thing, the way you think about it. But then the, the second option that I wanted to put forward as well is that how about we think of a comprehension task, that a verbal comprehension task that could be very easily done. Yeah. Because if we use the PPTT, but instead of using pictures, we use words, which is a version that David Howard is using at the moment because he is the inventor of the PPTT. If we use this task using the same, the same stimuli, but use, using words instead of the pictures, that could something that we could, be, that we could do to assess um, verbal semantics, which is something that we are not assessing very well at the moment. And I say that because we're assessing lots of production. There's lots of assessing of production, written production and spoken production of language, but we're not assessing comprehension. Mm -hmm. And at least in my experience, and I think in the experience of many people that work with, peop with patients um, that have aphasia and have language deficits, we see that people that have comprehension they have worse quality of life than people that have production deficits. At least that's my experience. I don't know what's your take on, on this. So we would all have a task that assesses comprehension, variable comprehension. I mean, maybe we might use it in combination with an object naming task. I think that would be a step forward in terms of assessing a language level that we're not tackling very well at the moment. Yes. When it comes to uh, data sharing, uh, I think we need to be very uh, careful because each country has different regulations uh, regarding data sharing, uh, whether it includes any personally identifiable, identifiable data and so on. Uh, these are also uh, European Union new regulations that will come um, uh, into practice, I think, next year or so. Um, so regardless of what kind of data we decide to share or what kind of, or, or in whichever format, we, format we, we agree on, we have to be very uh, careful with that. So yes. Just something to think the about. Theoretically, yes. In practice, uh, not sure. Okay. <laughs> but theoretically, yes. Yeah, here. No, yes, yes, yes. Yes, but I, I, yes, but I think that uh, we have done already several uh, co collaborative studies, uh, international collaborative studies, and we always ex exchange uh, Excel files, and it doesn't really. There is no really issue. I think. Uh, I don't think so that we will, there will be some uh, control. Of... I don't hear you actually. Yeah, uh, normally it should be anonymized, yes. Yeah. Here we are for, to discuss the ideas, not the legal issues. Of, to, when discussing the proposal of Sandro, that's for sure a nice idea to replicate and to, to compare our practice with those of the uh, Nader Sanai. To my opinion, that's quite easy to perform, to replicate. More important, possibly, is to focus on particular low gland gliomas that have uh, difficulties in seizure control, which are central areas, yep. low gland glioma, and central use man for that. And possibly, insular gliomas, they all share uh, less seizure control postoperatively. To my opinion, that's very interesting to focus and to understand why 
uh, we have difficulties in controlling, possibly just because we have less amount of resection, but it's interesting. And to my opinion, another point is the definition of what is a seizure control. Nader say it was Hengel 1, but within Hengel 1, they are not the same uh, epileptic issue. To my opinion, a real seizure control is 1A. That's the, uh, because in France, uh, to have for example, the right to have your driving license, you should be a one A. So uh, I, my opinion is to focus and to make the distinction between one A, one and the others. But I'll be very pleased to participate and we have a, a huge cohort of 500 patients and we'll, that's quite easy because the data are here, we just need time to, to compute them. I mean, I'm, I'm just an observer to this network, but I agree with Johan. Um, I think that um, with the sample size that you can accumulate through the network, um, you can answer questions that we were 